Live. So today I'd like to go over this uh, this video that J Dave Jones did. If you don't know who Dave Jones is, he has an amazing channel called EEV Blog. If, so if you're into anything electronics or engineering related, you should check out his channel. He does all sorts of different teardowns, reviews, teaching videos, great stuff. And he did a review of these two stations, the classic Hacko FX888D station and the Weller WE1010, which is supposed to be the new low-cost competitor to this Hacko FX888D. And both of these soldering stations cost somewhere around $100. And they are, you know, they're the standard old type of technology that I honestly did not know people even sold anymore for $100. And when I say the standard old technology, what I mean is that the heating element itself is, is not directly in the tip. The heating element is separate from the tip like this. So you can see the heating element is under the tip and the tip comes off. So there's a layer between the tip and the heating element. And even though they're touching, it's not the same as it being built into it. And you can tell anytime you have these stations where the where there's you know something that looks like a like something that kind of screws in on the top over here. You can like like this. Here, let me show you. So this thing over here, not sure if you can see my cursor. This over here, anytime you see that, you can be sure that you're looking at one of these really old style stations where the tip is separate from the heating element. And JBC, you know, obviously this is advertising and propaganda a little bit, but JBC has a good little write-up on why this, is, this old system, this old technology is not the best thing. So you could see when you set a JBC station to 350 Celsius, you get very low temperature drops and it recovers very quickly when you solder. Whereas when you use one of these older stations where the heating element is separate from the tip, you get a much worse drop in temperature and it also takes longer for it to recover and it doesn't quite recover as quickly so if you're soldering like one rest next rest next rest you can see that the temperature continues to get lower and lower and again this is you know this is enemy propaganda here this is uh, somebody else's advertising but i bring it up because this graph is the best way that i can come up with to demonstrate this without doing my own in-depth comparison and it demonstrates my point which is that J companies like JBC that use a different type of system where the heating element is built into the tip they recover faster and because of this newer technology it just works a lot better so it's measuring the temperature at the actual tip not the temperature of the heating element and since they're one piece it recovers faster and it makes for a much easier soldering experience now the problem with the JBC stations is that they cost a lot of money. So you'll see here, this little station, this thing, with one iron that you can't even change out, it's just one iron and then that's it, is $525. It's got a nice little interface, but still. And when you scroll down here, you'll see that some of their other stations where you, know, you, you, can, um, you can attach any type of iron you want to it, like 785, they're very, very expensive. And so there used to be a legitimate reason that people would choose to use this old kind of crap, which cost about $100, over this stuff, which cost $500. Now, then came in stations like the Hacko FX951. This Hacko FX951 uses a lot of the same technology that the JBC station uses, and it's only $236 in free shipping. So this is a much better deal, $236. I'm not exactly sure when the FX951 came out. I think the FX951 came out you, you approximately somewhere around maybe 10 years ago. So this FX951, I think all the blue and blue and yellow Hacko stuff started to come out around 10 years ago. And it's really good stuff because the cool thing about this, and I'll just bring it up on, uh, on another YouTube video if I can. Uh, let me just open up a new tab here and not be a noob with it. So you can see something else that I did a long time ago. I timestamped this video as well as I could, and I went over as much as I could in terms of how these two stations worked. And you can see that here. The video is JBC Precision Hot Air and Soldering with comparison to cheaper Hacko gear. I got all the timestamps here. And what, what I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt from my experience trying it for about an hour and a half and uh, you know working with it for a while afterwards is that the difference between this station and uh, the JBC stations over here is virtually nothing. The interface on the JBC is a lot nicer. The packaging of the JBC is a lot nicer. 
The actual day-to-day -day soldering of these two, as you can see in detail here, is virtually identical. So Hacko managed to take a lot of this cool technology that uh, that used to be the you know the call to JBC uh, back you know 15 years ago because JBC had this way sooner than companies like Hacko did, to my knowledge. J Hacko took that technology and incorporated it into a station that had a crappier interface and it cost 236 bucks. And this works virtually the same. You're, you're getting about the same type of graph where it heats up very quickly, and when you're soldering several joints at once, it doesn't do this thing where it just it keeps going down in temperature and slumping and slumping and slumping. I remember the, one of the people that I used to work with at Avatar always had his station set to something like 950 Fahrenheit all the time, and he just because he got sick and tired of this, and he never wound up ripping pads, which was amazing, but he just because he got tired of all this slumping. Now... Now, a lot of people will say something along, well, listen, Lewis, I understand this is $236. A lot of people don't want to spend that much just as a hobbyist. They would rather just spend $100. And, you know, then there's some of the comments in my videos where people say things like, you know, it's so elitist that you're that you're crapping on the $100 station just because people don't have the money for the $236 station. And my argument here on this video was that I will never go back to the stations where the heater is not integrated into the tip. It's terrible. And here is my reason for that argument. For the amount of money that you will pay for an FX888, this is important. So this is like, this is about $100. You can actually buy a knockoff iron to the FX951. So somebody sent me a knockoff one. So let's see, Hacko clone. And the thing about that iron is that it actually worked pretty damn well. Granted, the internal construction of that iron was not exactly something I would call five stars. But this station right here that I wound up reviewing, this is a station that's somewhere around $100. And it is a knockoff of the FX951. And it actually works almost identically to the FX951. I, in this video, you can see that I was soldering connectors with it. You can see me trying to solder a bunch of different things, some stuff that maybe had a heavy ground plane. And it was able to do a great job because it used the modern technology. So my argument here is that if you have a choice between buying from the original brand some old garbage technology where, you know, the, the heating element is separate from the tip, or you can buy some generic who the hell knows who makes it junk that is a knockoff of good technology, I will always go for a knockoff of good technology over the good brand name company producing crap technology. You know, when it, when it comes down to it, I don't... I would rather have a knockoff of a Pentium 4 than an original 386. It's, you know, I, I, it's still old technology. It doesn't matter what brand name is making it. It's still this old, tired junk. And you can see when he's even heating them up, these things are just absolutely terrible. Um, yeah, he, he did a really good job of reviewing this. Dave always does a good job of reviewing stuff, and he's very detailed with everything. But when he did, the, I think he did the, the heating up test with these things, and like the amount of time that it took to get to temperature... Here, like, this, this, this look at this. I mean, you could literally fall asleep waiting for these things to get to temperature. So he's about to turn them on. The first time, I don't like the Heiko switch on the side. Of, it's always kind of bugged me. So anyway, let's switch them both on. Much bigger uh, display, but uh, people, some people like the LED display. But that, there we go. We're heating up. We're heating up. Don't know what it's heating up to. It's, it's got 720. A bloody Fahrenheit garbage. Anyway, it's so <laughs> Just to correct Dave Jones there, Fahrenheit is not garbage. It is superior because you get more steps within the usable temperature range. But that... <laughs> that Paul Daniels is going to be mad at that too since he's from Australia. But that, that, that being said... I mean, like, look at the amount of time this thing takes to get to 266 Fahrenheit. This is awful. I mean, just imagine this recovering as you're working on anything with a real ground plane. Now, again, the, the, the dichotomy that's made is I am either going to buy a $100 station that uses the old technology or a $250 to $500 station that uses the new technology. And my argument is that you can spend $100 and get a station that uses the new technology. And there is nothing special about this. Do you keep in mind that, the, that it's been a long time? You know, JBC used to be, you know, the top of the line because in the early 2000s, nobody else was building the... the, the heating element into the tip. Only JBC was doing that. So JBC had the right to charge these prices for everything. But then companies like Hacko came along, and they made it $236. So then companies like JBC didn't really 
have the unique privilege of being able to say we're worth the 1200 or whatever for this to the average end user or the average repair shop anymore. And I, what my argument is, is that since it's now 2018, since it's been damn near 10 years since this thing has been introduced, that this is no longer special, that the traditional HACO FX 951 with its alarm clock interface and its that this technology is at a point where some $100 knockoff from China will do this thing's job just fine. So my argument is you do not need to spend the money on the expense of HACO if you are thinking of getting any of this stuff. You don't have to choose, do I want an FX888 or an FX951? I would say, do I want a HACO FX888 or if I only have $100, do I want to buy the knockoff? And my argument is that you're almost always going to be better off with a knockoff of the iron with the heating element built into the tip than you are the original brand. Now, the next thing I'd like to get to is I have some interest. There was one other interesting comment here, and I think it was about Pace. Uh, let's just find that one. He's American, but evidently not patriotic enough to buy a Pace. Now, some people, when they're saying this, are kidding, and it's all done in good fun. But some people say that, and they actually, you know, they're really surprised that I don't buy Pace because they're American. Don't I want to buy American? Don't I want to support America? Don't I want to, you know, make sure that people got their jobs? And one of the things that gets me when, when, when we're discussing this or when we're talking about the country that it's manufactured in is that people don't think that whole thing through about, about jobs. So the, before we even get to everything else about Pace, and they seem like a very nice company. Very, you know, they're very nice people. I got to talk to uh, Mr. Kaplan there a while ago. They, they seem like they're, they really know the industry. They're on top of their stuff. They're great. Uh, but the issue that I have when it comes to Pace and the reason that I haven't tried a lot of their stuff is if we go, let's just try and find a tab with this thing. So check it out. So let me show you what their hot air station looks like here. So they have a hot air station, the ST300. This is $1,226 plus shipping. So for $1,226, you get this hot air station with two knobs. Now, I'm not going to argue that you need more than two knobs with a hot air station. I'm not arguing that you need some fancy schmancy interface. I'm not going to argue that you need profiles because 99% of the people doing this stuff don't need any of that fancy schmancy stuff. But here's my argument. This station is not worth about $950 to $1,000 more than, hey, I'm going to be shilling a little bit, this station. This is $299, maybe back to $271 once the shortage of them is over, and some other sites are $350. So $271 to $350. This station is less than one-third the price of this station. This station does everything this does, and it has presets, which this one doesn't. There is not a chip on any motherboard that you will not be able to remove with this that you can remove with this. The Pace is never going to be able to remove a chip that the Quick cannot. Now, People will say, well, don't, but, but if you buy a quick, somebody in America is not going to have a job. They're not going to, you know, you're not supporting American workers. And my argument here is that I am supporting American workers because a lot of people who are, who I'm selling this equipment to are Americans who, like me, started with something like, uh, they started with something like $268. So I've often said that I started in this business with $268. $68, and I used that uh, $268 to, you know, build my business and buy my tools and buy my parts. Now, if somebody else is starting out where I did and they have maybe two or 500 bucks, they can afford to buy a knockoff hacko, even an original hacko. They can afford to buy this station over here for $236 plus this thing over here for $200 something dollars, and they can get started. But they're not going to be able to afford to buy this. So, if equipment like this is available, people will be able to get started. I will then be able to help create American jobs of repair shop owners. But if all the equipment that I buy costs, or I, I suggest people get, costs this much money, or costs this much money, then that's American jobs that are not created. Because your mom and pop repair shop that's starting out with 500 or or 1000 bucks uh, from their basement before they're able to get a store, they won't be able to enter the industry, which means that you now have a barrier to entering the industry. So when the equipment has a $900 to $1,000 price premium on it, just so that we can feel good about the fact that it was manufactured in America, 
you have maybe an extra 10 or 20 jobs in America of the people that are manufacturing this two-knob monstrosity for $1,200, but you're missing out on the hundreds upon hundreds of jobs that would have been created if the device was actually affordable. My interest as a patriot, as an American, as someone who cares about our jobs, my interest is in getting as many technicians as possible to, to start working on the, uh, the, uh, all the equipment that I, Jessa and I and um, Jason at SDS go over on our channels. My, and Chris Long, I want to see as many people as possible get started in this business. Those are the jobs that I care about. I don't really care that much about the robot and the assembly line assembling the station. I'm sorry. I know that that sounds mean, but that, that, that's just not where my care lies. If I, see, if I had a choice between creating 1,000 repair tech jobs or sustaining 10 factory worker jobs, I will choose the creating 1,000 uh, repair tech jobs over sustaining 10 or 20 factory workers anytime, any day. And I genuinely don't understand what it is that's going to make this thing $1,000 worth more than this thing. Now, when it comes to some of the other stuff, you know, pe I have pe had people say, but Lewis, but Lewis, the quality, you won't get the same quality. And this was one of the, this, this was one of the most interesting things. And as I said, when I spoke to Pace, and this was a while ago, this was about a year, a year and a half ago, I think. This was, I think, somewhere around mid-2016. They were very, very nice. They were very kind people. They knew the industry very well. They engaged with me. They seemed to understand uh, the products that they were creating. Great people. But they were, when, when we got to Hot Tweezers, <laughs> and I've said this, I'm sorry, I can't help but laugh while I tell this story. Uh, when, we, when it got to the question of Hot Tweezers, the funniest thing happened. They, I said something like, so how long are you using them for? And I said, yeah, well, I mean, well, why do you ask? You know, it's one of those questions where it's like, you know, where I, I can't answer with something, I, with the actual answer. I got to, hey, hey, why do you ask? It's, you know, like, so, so then they say, you know, like, how long do you use it for? Well, you know, just why do you ask? You know, is it a long time, a short time? And they said, well, you know, if you use it for a long time, it may start to fatigue you because it may start to kind of burn your fingers. And I go, what? Oh, yeah, you know, it's not a big deal, but if, like, you know, you're holding them for, you know, 5 or 10 or 20 minutes, they may start to kind of burn your hands. <laughs> what? And that's the thing that's supposed to be made in America. Whereas with the Hacko, these $272 tweezers, which are the ones that Jess and I recommend, and you can get them with the entire station for $536, bucks, so $536. You know, I'm picking out the wrong one there. FM 2023. Let's see if I can... All right, so you get the tweezers with the entire uh, setup for them for 272, and then you can buy the station for about four hundred and ninety-four dollars. So maybe like after tax or whatever and all that stuff, you probably come out to like seven hundred something for the hot tweezers. The Hacko setup with the hot tweezers, in my opinion, is actually better quality because I've used Hacko's hot tweezers and they've never burned my fingers. So here again, I have a choice. Am I going to go with the manufacturer that does not manufacture in America, but does not burn my hands? Or am I going to go with the place that manufactures in America, but costs more money and burns my hands? Now, I would say that it's patriotic to not burn the hands of the techs who I'm attempting to create jobs for, more than it is patriotic to support the factory workers at the factory designing a product that burns me as I use it. You know, you have to do a little bit more than say, made in America, support things made in America, made in America is the best. I, I, I don't care if it's made in America. I, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is have you made a better product? Do you have a compelling reason for me to buy your product? Have you, you know, if I see made in America as, okay, you made a great product, that just so happens to be a benefit. So if you got two companies and the price is within 20 to 30% of each other, I will probably choose the one that was made in America. If you have two products of equal quality, I'll probably tipping point to the one that's made in America. But if you have two products and one of those products costs something along the lines of uh, $1,200 and is less featured than the one that's $300, I'm probably going to go with the one that's not made in America. And what, you know what I'd really like to do? I'd like to do a second review of one of these knockoff hackos. So I did a review of this knockoff hacko in 2016, 
and it worked very well. The internal construction wasn't so great. But it's been a year and a half, so what I'd like to actually do is I'd like to find one of these that could be sold for around $100, and I'd like to check out its internal construction to see if it's improved. Because you could see here in the knockoff hacko that I opened, it was, it was, it was pretty bad. I, I'm not going to lie. It was pretty bad. Hey, you know, it was put together properly and durably, but, you know, they did stuff, like, they didn't even bother cutting off the leads. Like, look at this. And some of this stuff is just shameful. You know, you should, you should cut off the leads before you send the damn thing out. So what, I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to get one of these knockoff stations and see if they have improved at all. Because if they have improved, I would argue that there's genuinely no point to buying either one of these stations that use the old technology if you could get something that uses the new technology. Because I, I would happily take generic station that uses the I would happily take a generic station that uses the new technology over name brand station using the old technology. 